Good afternoon, Navin. Good afternoon. Sorry, your morning. <laughs> my night, my night. It is it is 9.30 p.m. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Okay. We're all confused. Okay. Lovely to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you, Caroline. Hello. Hi. 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 Hi, everyone. Um, hi, Sam. Oh, yeah. uh, so there's just the, the two of you, but we had a good chat the other day. Um, yeah. so I think that will be fine. I'm, I'm actually just going to start briefly by saying, um, I think in the research, sort of 80 percent of people responded to the term digital transformation. But I'd just like to ask you both what what you mean by it. What do you think that, you know, what does it actually mean? Is it just a bit of fiddling around the edge? You know, whatever you think. But just to sort of get us talking about that to start with, if that's OK. Is it 30 or 40? I can't remember how long it is. Well, sort of 35, 40 ish. I'll see how we're going. So I've divided it up sort, sort of maybe four minutes talking about what we think digital transformation mm. is. Um, and then uh, the effects of the pandemic and whether that's still going, you know, continuing at the same speed, whether there was reluctance, whether people were surprised and delighted with what they found once they were pitched into it and all that kind of thing. The benefits and the challenges of changing at speed and whether that's calmed down a little bit, but what the biggest changes were. And we've got the top three reasons uh, from the survey for companies to implement change, which was time saving with automated processes, moving from manual paper based to digital processes and data insights and trends for analysis and improvement. And really, I mean, the, I can see the paper based was uh, precipitated by COVID. <laughs> the other two were really, yeah. you know, they, that's what they're getting out of it, isn't it now? Um, then whose responsibility for leading? Who should it be? The best way to make it happen. And that's when I hope you'll have some nice examples, Navin, because you must have a lot of experience of persuading yeah, exactly. people and sorting yeah. them out. Um, and what the ideal combination is. Um, and I think you mentioned when you were both talking that there were sort of differences, whether it was on premise or in the cloud. Uh, and, and then what the barriers are. So lack of effective strategy, lack of clear leadership. Um, and, though, and I noticed in the title introducing people, it said, what do teams need to succeed in this transformation to digital? So maybe we'll finish up with that. OK. Yeah. And it's 1559. Everybody happy? <laughs> <laughs> and it's healthy to differ, Naveen. I'm just saying that now. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right. Well, you can't get hold of each other's throats, so that's good. <laughs> I can do. I can do it on screen. Hold on. <laughs> on screen. <laughs> so happy, Sam. You'll just yeah, kick yeah, us I off with you. And we'll... I think we're good to go. We're just at the top of the hour now. So if everyone's happy, we'll get. I'll click the get started button, and, and off you go. Okay. Yeah. Good. Hi, we're about to start our webinar looking at digital transformation within finance teams. People are just joining us now. And so just before we get started in earnest, if you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat room, we can see where you are now, um, just before we get going. Great. So proper welcome to this webinar on digital transformation in finance teams. So what do we mean by it? How fast is it happening? What's happening? And how can you transform your operations successfully? We have the latest IFOL report, which has investigated some of the latest trends, and that's what our guests today will be discussing. We will be providing you with a best practice guide following the session, so no need to make any notes if you don't want to. Uh, please put any questions you have in the chat and we'll pick them up as soon as we can. I'm Sue Beardsmore and I'm joined today by one of our IFOL experts, Caroline Adams. And for those of you who maybe aren't members or students with us already, our IFOL experts, amongst other things, are responsible for delivering live virtual masterclasses each month. Caroline has over 20 years experience in shared services as a senior finance manager and in IT. She's built teams, led them through real significant change and is particularly focused on payables. Hi, Caroline. Hi, Sue. Uh, we're also joined today, I'm pleased to say, by our special guest, Navin Gupta, who's Executive Vice President of Datamatics Global Services. 
And Navin has over 25 years experience in operations, sales, business consulting and program management. And he's worked across many sectors, most sectors, I would say, but including particularly financial services. Datamatics works with over 200 companies right across the world and enables them to develop and reinvent themselves with digital technologies. So he's got plenty of experience of what we're talking about, and I hope plenty of examples too. So Navin, welcome to you today. Thanks, you. Thanks. So the findings from the latest IFOL report, which was sponsored by Datamatics and investigated digital transformation within finance teams. Key questions were looking at how many finance teams have invested in digital technology to manage finance processes since the pandemic and the effect of the pandemic on that process whose responsibility people thought it was to actually make transformations happen. And it also asked what the barriers to digital transformation were. So perhaps we could just start briefly. Um, in the research, about 80% of people were familiar with the term digital transformation, but I suspect it doesn't mean the same thing to everybody, does it? What, what Caroline, what do you regard it as? Um, I look as digital transformation is about removing the need to do manual tasks. I think that's a simple way of explaining it. Uh, for example, doing uh, data entry of an invoice, I would be looking for the digital transformation of how you get that data into the AP system without someone sat there uh, keying data. I think that's my simple uh, description of what digital trans an example of digital transformation is removing any manual processes and steps okay Navin would you agree with that uh, definitely uh, I agree with Caroline but I will add on to it not only apart from manual the digital transformation enables you to automate the entire journey let's say even if we are talking of invoice processing the entire journey from data ingestion to approval mechanism building validation uh, by itself and approval hierarchy and business rules approving it. So machine is approving the entire and it is straight through processing, no manual intervention at all is what I call a digital transformation. So you call that transformation, that's when everything has changed and people yes. have gone through the uh, whole uh, journey. I, I imagine uh, it takes a little while to get there. Um, <laughs> In, in the survey, 58% of people uh, responded and said they were partially automated, and 25% said they were fully automated within Navin's book, would, would be that end-to-end -end process. Okay, well, thanks for that, for, for a starting point. We'll bear that in mind as we go on. So the effects of the pandemic, they were profound, weren't they? I mean, how, how did that play out in your experience with different teams? What, what changed first, shall we say? I mean, for for me personally, I, I was um, still working in Debenhams then and heading up the shared uh, service centre. And it was quite alien about people working from home, uh, specifically in an accounts payable anyway. So overnight, you know, the world was turned upside down and it was, well, um, we, we're going to need to make some process changes to remain operational, really. How do we do it? Where are we going to start? What do we need to do? Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, when you work for a retailer, you have to pay your suppliers or otherwise they're going to stop um, delivering to you. So really, it was about uh, focusing on priorities and what we need to do first um, and for us that was looking at um, uh, how documents were being received into the business so very quickly suppliers who'd been quite sluggish to send in pdf um, invoices without going through the whole xml and edi route which was too long because you needed it to happen then um, that certainly was a huge benefit of getting rid of paper because no one were nobody was in the offices to to um, process the invoices so you know that was a big win to start off with and then it was looking at uh, who was approving invoices and um, with Ed, again I'm smiling because everyone were, uh, um, had a laptop in front of them and they couldn't say that they were too busy to approve invoices so actually it speeded up the invoice approval as well and surprise surprise that that meant that you know suppliers were getting paid on time much 
uh, a greater percentage of suppliers were being paid on time. Um, but it also meant looking at um, our payment runs, the frequency of payment runs, and looking to ensure that we were doing uh, the utmost to ensure the wheels kept turning. I think that was a fair yeah. summary. And, and briefly, before we move on to Navin, so presumably there wasn't any reluctance because it simply had to be done. But but was the feeling that that was a permanent change or just something that was going to happen to keep you going? Um, I think there's two, two bits to that. One was about all the positives of making it some of the I would say 90% of it was probably a permanent change and even when it went back to hybrid working it's about why would you go back to how we were working previously if you've changed the processes and made those efficiencies and it was all good news you, you know you, we're not looking back we're looking forwards so it's again well what do we need to do next to take it up another level so because that's just how you know businesses work it's all about change sure so Navin was that your experience with your clients that they had to do it but but they made some good changes absolutely because as uh, Carolyn uh, took the example of retail uh, if you look at the manufacturing, it is the entire vicious circle. If supplier does not get paid in time, they will not deliver the raw material, production will not happen, wood will not get produced, and they will not be able to sell. So the, and the first objective was to keep the light on. And to keep the light on, you have to, even if you are working from home, even if there are restrictions, you have to really make payment on time to the supplier so that you get your raw material for the production and the cycle is going on. So with none of our customers, we saw any uh, apart from first two or three months of the COVID, we never saw any production going down or the, uh, the cycle was maintained. And because of the automation, whatever changes of data ingestion to processing of invoice to approval, auto approval, and then finally early payment, as Carolyn said, they also started measuring the supplier satisfaction. And surprisingly, even though it was pandemic and CFOs were looking for a cash flow, supplier satisfaction went up quite high because they were getting paid the payment for, they were able to track their own payment or invoice into the system because of the automation. So they were forced to see the benefits, but they did see the benefits in the they end. The benefit, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and of course, some of the other benefits, I, I'm sure now, Carolyn mentioned hybrid working. Caroline mentioned hybrid working, but working from home, people being able to do that has been of a benefit to, to businesses, hasn't it? Doing that sort Quite of- Quite a lot, not only that, even for the CFO now, when they are looking at a digitized and they are able to really segregate the payment or capitalizing on the early payment discounts as well, because supplier is in the need of money. And if CFOs are able to better off the cash flows, they're actually able to improve their working capital requirement, thereby reducing the interest cost also. Yeah. So even if uh, uh, I move out from the people's perspective, from the CFO's perspective, his, his KRAs and KPIs were going multiple notches above of what they were doing earlier. Okay. So, um, has it continued? Has the, have these changes that were forced on people that they embraced, that they could see the benefits, have they continued at the same rate? And have has it convinced not, 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 other people? Mostly continued people who have not done it during that time were forced to adopt the model of transformation because now they can see the improvement in the finance function and the finance teams and utilize their finance team for more value added job rather than just doing invoice processing. Okay. I, I'm going to disagree with Navin there. <laughs> we thought we might have a bit of this. Um, I think it depends as a business and what sector you're in, where you are on that journey. Not every CFO has seen the light and um, looked at digital transformation, certainly from an AP perspective. And uh, even when you're out and about networking, it's quite surprising when you find businesses that are still manually inputting um, invoices this day and age, because you think if you go back to, you know, the COVID, well, how did they manage during COVID to, uh, to get their invoices in? They must have been in an industry where you were allowed to go to work, which we won't go into. But, but um, it just depends on where you are on that journey. You know, we can all see see the benefits of, of doing it because, you know, 
whether it, you're a CFO and it's working capital or you're your AP manager and you can work out your cash flow, you've got to be in it to see it sometimes. And sometimes it's hard to convince others outside of, of that uh, circle what the benefits are. So, so, um, so Karagan, uh, earlier where the statutory requirements were to keep the paper invoice for seven years as a statutory requirement for most of the government across the globe. Now, if you see even government helped, many governments like in Europe, even in Asia, e-invoicing is mandated by the government. Mm -hmm. So when the government is also pushing the entire transformation, as US, it is still not done. It will be done, I'm sure. But if you look at the push from the government and the statutory bodies also to push e-invoicing so it is digital. If you, uh, India has already adopted it, we are 100% e-invoicing. Europe, by 2027, the entire Europe has to be uh, e-invoicing. So... There is CFOs will have no option now but to go on a digital footprint because now there are mandate coming from a statutory requirement. Yeah, so so the pressure is coming from um, all sorts of places. But but one of the things that I've heard uh, many uh, contributors talk about is the benefits in terms of protection from fraud mm -hmm. of, of digital transformation. I mean, what, what would you both mm -hmm. say about that? So basically, there are controls. That, and that is where I said the automation of a process, not just like you ingest the invoice and just pay it. There is a control, there are thresholds amount, various controls will have to be built into the system so that those, for example, if the workflow is robust, then you cannot have a duplicate invoice. There is a zero duplicate invoice chances to happen, that kind of a scenario to happen. There is a two-way, three-way matching which can be automated. And if these things are inbuilt into the system, then there is no way fraud, you will allow fraud to happen. There may be certain exceptions which may still happen, uh, but then you will have to build controls around that within the digitized system to automate the entire process uh, by for compliance and the risk management as well. Okay, Caroline? Yeah, uh, I think there's probably, um, well, two, two areas that I can think of immediately, which is <clears throat> no offense to any software supplier, um, but you always get told that the software will pick up duplicates. Yes, the software will pick up duplicates, but you know you can find ways around that. And if as a business you haven't got standardization on how you process those invoices, letting duplicates through and perhaps some of them be fraudulent um, is a door that needs to be closed. So I'm a great supporter of using uh fraud ap software that looks for duplicates that looks for transaction spikes that uh looks for unusual patterns you can do it yourself but obviously there are software providers out there um and i think you need that added layer because fraudsters go to work like we do nine to i'll say nine to five but um that's their job and they're always looking for the way in so the second biggest area of fraud is uh, vendor master file and if you haven't got your vendor master file locked down from opening up a supplier uh, uh, the biggest one is obviously amending bank account details there's lots of best practice out there if you're not following that best practice you are opening yourself up uh, for fraud and then the third thing is around payments, and it's about having a non-verbal uh, payment uh, policy so that the only payments that you do are through the AP ledger approved by the right hierarchy. It's very easy for the fraudsters, and I've seen it, um, to imitate the CFO or the CEO, and, and you get... Um, a phone call, an email, uh, you know, a message, make this payment and do it now. If you're following AP best practice, you won't, you, you know, you wouldn't even look at it twice. Yeah. Um, but the but the fraudsters are not going away. No. And, absolutely, and, absolutely. So, absolutely. And that is where vendor portal, for example, there is a vendor portal. And when you're doing a vendor onboarding, you are letting vendor upload document it by himself or herself. And then system is validating all the vendor text text numbers or even uh, your social security numbers with the 
inform uh, by logging into the government system and validating the numbers as well as when the bank details are provided by vendor themselves you are doing a penny drop to see the bank is real or not so you can build all those validation in the vendor portal kind of a system where you are making sure that whatever vendors are there in the vendor portal are genuine and their details are correct and so, that's a different with your digital yeah uh, uh, software that is the difference from doing it all manually to having software that does it for you so exactly but, but it presumably doesn't uh, obviate the need for having best practice uh, in place uh, oh, digital on its own absolutely. is not going to solve anything absolutely and i agree with caroline you will get a let's say for example if there is a uh, we as a service provider we are getting an email from the cfo of the organization we of course will consider that genuine right but then if based upon the amount and other controls and the best practices you will still have to verify and put it through approval mecha mechanism and that is where the best practices are so important to prevent those fraud which are done in the name of ceo or cfo of the organization okay well the top three reasons from the research uh commissioned by you that uh, was found in the eiffel survey the top three reasons for companies to implement the change were time saving with automated processes the move from manual paper based to digital processes presumably given a massive shove by the pandemic but also data insights and trends for analysis and improvement so they were the benefits that people saw if they moved to more digital operations w would you agree with those you wouldn't pick up anything else particularly i'm I'm a great believer in um, looking at data, but first of all, you need clean data and obviously getting invoices in digital, I can't say this word, digitali, digitally, digitally, uh, <laughs> we know um, what yeah, um, is one of the first steps to move away from mistypings, from, from whatever, if you've got clean data, uh, the insights and trends that you can get from looking at that data, you know, the world is your oyster and it's about selling that to the CFO or the COO um, or the, any, anybody in the C-suite really. An example of that would be to um, look at your vendor master file, uh, look at your pay method, your pay terms uh, from a working capital perspective, you know, are you maximising uh, the pay terms, having preferred suppliers with different types of spend, spend analysis, you know, the world you're always to so I could go on and on and on, but I won't. <laughs> okay. um, we've, we've got a question that let's answer as we go along. What's one of the biggest hurdles in the process of digital transformation for AP? I think we'll be talking more about this a little bit later on, but maybe you'd uh, have, a, have a go at it now. John Ford sent that in. Okay. So, so basically what I see is uh, the biggest hurdle is the fear of controls and the fraud and the risk uh, because all the CFOs are have to comply uh, from all the regulations perspective. What, the biggest uh, disadvantage on a bottleneck is the fear. So moment that fear is allayed or removed in the mind by showing the power of the system or a digital system, uh, then adoption becomes much easier. Second is the change management. People who are used to carry on the financial operations like the way they were doing for the last 30 years, the change management is the uh, second biggest reason for failure or not adopting the digital transformation as per me. Caroline, uh, what's your view? Um, completely different, as you would expect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the biggest hurdle is getting the business case signed off to to get the capital investment to do the digital transformation. And that's about um, having finance, working with IT and basing that business case, not purely on reducing headcount um, in accounts payable, because you should be um, highlighting the benefits from whether it's from working capital, paying suppliers on time, lots and lots of different measurements uh, straight through processing. There's just loads of KPIs that you can base it on. And it's about understanding what you can deliver from that digital transformation, not not on removing people. Um, that's I so, think so that's to me, probably that stage comes uh, to me. That stage comes later once the acceptance that of digital transformation comes in. The moment those two challenges of change manager and the risk are removed, then I have seen finance department preparing the ROI themselves. And I totally agree, it is not only the headcount reduction, it is the improvement of the KPIs. 
Well, what is the turnaround time? What is the accuracy rate? How much is the removal of a duplicate invoices? How much is the prevention of a fraud? Or uh, then how, the, on the positive side, how much capitalization of early payment discount? How much capitalization of a bulk discounting they are able to do, a uh, customer is able to do looking at a supplier spend? Those comes later. The first is the acceptance itself that yes, we should be digital transformed. There is no risk in that. But don't you don't you think that the because the world has changed, their head should already be there anyway? No, it should be. But uh, and I have seen success when the acceptance by the CFO or finance organization is there. All these later becomes easier to showcase it to them. Uh, the all the KPIs improvement along with the cost reduction also. Mm -hmm. OK, well, that sort of moves us on quite nicely to a, a bit of a discussion about whose responsibility is it to lead any transformation? I mean, uh, apart, apart from uh, Navin's point about who needs convincing that everybody's got to get going on it, but that's a, a bit mixed up with the leading, isn't it? Who, whose responsibility do you think it is in an organization to, to start the journey and to implement it? To like me, it is a CF. Cool. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, you, it's fine. You, Navin, you, you kick off, Navin, and then we'll go to Caroline. To me, it is a CFO. And uh, this kind of uh, uh, transformation has to be led from the top. Once there is a direction from the top, then adoptions down the level becomes much more easier. Mm -hmm. Caroline? I agree. And I think it's a collaboration between IT and finance in that uh, most organizations have a... Um, a finance systems manager or an, I'm not sure on job titles but I'm not going to get hung up on that and normally they're the like the in between between uh, finance as a customer and IT so it's usually somewhere in between working in IT um, but you usually find as well for from my experience that that person has probably worked in finance and is a qualified accountant uh, uh, um, and that's the best of both worlds, really. Navin, you must have experience of persuading people that don't really want to be persuaded. Can, can you give us <laughs> some examples of how that works, how you show them that really they need? I mean, you've said they'll need to because of various impetus from government and whatever. But but give us some ex examples of, of how you persuaded people that they need to get going on this. So, so, so whenever there is a, uh, for example, the discussion which is starting with the CFO, and as I mentioned, CFO is the one person who needs the maximum convincing. And, and the way to show them is uh, power of the system is a, sort of a doing a proof of concept uh, at their data on their invoices and show them the power of the system of first, how turnaround time will uh, improve, how accuracy will increase, how you will stop and deliberately inject duplicate invoice and show them that how those duplicate invoices will be stopped. And then we ourselves calculate the ROI for them and show it to them that you will recover the cost within the first three or four months of the time, depending upon the volume of invoices. It is done. That then there is no more discussion of convincing is required. Then they yeah. talk about how urgently you can do it, how fast you can do it is the next question which comes in. Yeah. So facts, figures, and ROI are the are the the way to get to to move things on really and truly. Exactly. Yeah. It's all about the numbers. <laughs> all about the numbers. And and are there particular ways? I mean, I I know in a previous discussion you've talked about um, setting things up on premise or in the cloud. Uh, do things like that come into a conversation? Are people particularly worried about different ways of approaching they, it? They are. They are looking at the data privacy rules and uh, uh, regulations coming from the various governments, as well as they themselves are not very. Uh, they're scared of the data getting uh, out of the system, but. I am finding cloud adoption much more and increasing with much pace uh, for entire CFO work because the cloud is convincingly giving them the very protected environment for them because it is not, not like a public cloud which is open to all. It is sort of a private cloud hosted by either Amazons or Azures of this world or Oracle of this world where they are taking the uh, commitment of entire protection of data whatsoever customer they are having on the cloud. Caroline, have you seen people be suddenly convinced or is it always a bit of a slow drip process? I mean, you said it's the figures, but but what's your experience? Of how uh, people I think it? once uh, again, you know, with the, the pace of change and how things work in IT world, um, most people should have got over not having on-premise software. The benefits 
but to of having it all in the cloud um again not getting into technical pipes and look you know uh, whatever the biggest benefit is about upgrades happen automatically and there is no downtime or large cost to the organization of having to test it take people out get, writing test scripts um and then ensuring it's doing what they want it to do when it when you're back up and working and planning that into the finance calendar isn't always an easy thing to do either so to me you know apart from all the obvious reasons of it being up in cloud um it's all about the cost the ongoing cost it remove it removes that from from the budget okay um john raised the issue about the biggest hurdle to to implementation uh, a little while ago but let's talk a little bit more about some of the barriers that people in the real world find to digital transformation um, and perhaps we can also talk about what we actually mean by transformation rather than just a little bit of digital work um so what about a strategy what what should be involved in a strategy in your view caroline and then we'll get navin's take on it um, again, depending on what industry you work in and what and what sector, it's what what is the business strategy. So, if as a business I'm focused on working capital, then my um, my goalposts. I know what the I should know what the the end looks like, and then work back from from there really as to what I'm going to do in what order. Or it could be, um, um, I'm trying to think now, um, it could be, I don't know, I might have a really poor uh, paying on time to suppliers percentage at the moment. And the strategy is that as a business, you know, we want to work in partnership with our strategic suppliers. So therefore, that's that would be taking all your processes apart, which you're going to do anyway, and look at how I get my invoice from A to B with the right controls in place to ensure I increase my paying my suppliers on time. So it's all about knowing what the strategy of the business is, and then you build your um, roadmap to support what you're going to do, what you're going to deliver in what order. Right. Navin, what would you tell me to do to, to put an effective strategy in place if I came to you for some support to transform to digital? So first, the firstly, uh, the way I recommend is, is to set up our objectives. What are the objectives? What are the KPIs of the KRS? Mm -hmm. So are you looking for only, as Carolina has rightly pointed out, headcount reduction? That may not be the right reason. There has to be a KPIs and the KRS to drive the strategy. Now, if a KPI, uh, KPIs are for uh, working capital improvement or supply satisfaction improvement or availability of a good quality raw material and time is the KPI, then I will embark upon a journey and create a strategy of looking at the process which is uh, manual, which is taking too much of a time, which is really uh, a fat process to really improve my process and then go towards that journey, setting up the uh, uh, KPIs, defining the and benchmarking it against best in the class and then defining the roadmap. So, Suk, if I can just add to that, I can, I can see someone's asked a question. One of the strategies uh, we had was we wanted to communicate with um, suppliers or customers uh, electronically. So that meant everything coming in, we wanted it electronically and everything going out, we wanted electronically from uh, and we wanted suppliers to be able to self-serve. So that I think that was, you know, that was 16 years ago we did that. So it, at that time it was um, leading by example, uh, I would say. But but it's also about thinking green, our, foot, our carbon footprint and all the rest of ESG. It's also about bringing that into it now as well. Yeah, because that's moved on quite a lot, hasn't it? Shall, yeah. shall we tackle Eric's question? I'll, I'll read it out and if, while you're both thinking about it. Um, and it's a fair point. With ever-changing business environments, 
and now that businesses are by and large digitally transforming, are there generally accepted standards developed to guide in AP automation? And what are the benchmarks of digital transformation? So are there any accepted standards uh, to guide in AP automation? Caroline, do you want to speak to that first? Oh, I was just going to have a little think. Oh, all right. Navin, <laughs> can you come on, Navin? Caroline's so, looking so, so, Eric, so Eric, Eric, believe me, I didn't read your question before I use the word benchmarking. Uh, so now <laughs> I'm saying, uh, so I, there are benchmarks available and there yeah. are accepted standards, as I was telling you earlier also, that defining uh, controls for just to take a few examples, the threshold limit of non-PO invoices, right? So even though you want it to be a straight through process, but you are still defining a thresholds and beyond that threshold, what are the approval mechanism, which are going through that approval hierarchy for the higher amounts. And again, the benchmark for our example, now uh, we all used to uh, calculate NPS and CSAT and customer satisfaction. The most important benchmark has now become a supplier satisfaction. Many organizations have started measuring supply satisfaction. And if you look at uh, even IEFOL as well as other analyst organizations also, so you will find them providing that benchmark, what are the best in class, whether it is a turnaround time, whether it is a accuracy, whether it is a duplicate payment, whether it is a fraud payment, all benchmarks are there. And after you do your current state as assessment, you can set up a target for yourself that what is the three months, six months, 12 months plan. And how do you want to achieve it through the digital transformation? Is uh, any partner like ourselves could help you in that journey? Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, similar lines really. I can remember seeing a document which was good, better, best, um, which is not very good grammar, but um, and and that was the measurements of. Um, uh, People talk about touchless processing, and again, depending where you are as to what you achieve with touchless processing. But if you have got this, this, and this, the expectation is, you know, your touchless processing will be this. If you've got XML, EDI, um, and any other standard electronic uh, and proper electronic invoicing, you know, you would expect your match rate to, or your um, uh, end to end again to be a percentage so you can look at KPIs but it is all about you know what are your peers achieving and a lot of time you get that from networking um, events. IFO uh, has got some benchmarking um, but it depends what you're looking at it's all about measuring your KPIs and what are most relevant to you as a business there's no point in measuring KPIs on touchless processing, if you haven't got the software that's doing it for you, it's yeah. just it's just pointless. I agree. I totally agree. And also, for example, generally, what uh, we don't do, uh, we don't uh, calculate the intangible efforts. For example, the duplicate invoices. Now, how much is the effort we are spending on? First of all, finding out on the duplicate invoices, then on the recovery of the payment which has been made uh, twice. So those intangibles also are important, plus your month end processes, your AP to GL reconciliation, how much time it is taking, if it is an automotive process, uh, it should be happening in hours rather than days time, so that your month end closing is reduced to 48 hours rather than seven days kind of a time. So all those KPIs are important and are, and as Caroline has rightly said, you should assess yourself first. Then I fall and other analyst organization, you should, and of course, networking, what your peers are doing which will help you define your roadmap for digital transformation. Uh, and of course, there are increasing numbers. I know, Caroline, you have a view about not too many KPIs because they become unmanageable, but, but businesses are being required to do some reporting on ESG uh, targets, yes. aren't they? So we'll need help with that, really. Uh, and I suspect them are possibly more unfamiliar with, with those kinds of targets and how to measure and report than, than others. OK, um, one thing I know you probably both feel quite strongly about is you can't just automate what you're doing currently. You actually need to transform the business. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> I'll give you a minute or so each before we finish on what you think is important that way around. Oh. OK. Caroline, you go first. Yeah. Do not automate <laughs> what you've got now. Uh, that's the biggest clue. Um, it's about re-engineering 
and simplifying the processes that you've got. It's about taking out unnecessary steps. It's about looking at how, how should you get from A to B and what do you need to do in a controlled uh, environment? So for me personally, it's challenging what you have, what it is you're trying to deliver and how you get there. And that's all about change and process re-engineering. Navin? I agree. Uh, for, uh, just to take an example of what Caroline was mentioning earlier also. From a data perspective, it is garbage in, garbage out. If you mm -hmm. just automate your non-clean data, first of all, then you will always get the non-clean process as well. Secondly, uh, ju just taking a one use case or example I've seen with one of the customer where I was really surprised, vendor evaluation was done by three separate function department. And your uh, procurement was doing it, finance was doing it, and of course, business was doing it. And I was I, I really appalled that to look at three various departments. And if I automate the uh, way it is, rather than consolidating and standardizing the vendor evaluation with one particular function so that I'm not investing effort at three different places, right? And, and this is just a small example. The same could be true for the invoices also. And although we have been talking more of an AP uh, uh, till now, but if you look at AR as a function and any other, uh, whether it is P2P, O2C, or R2R as a function, if you automate whatever wrong process you are doing, you will end up doing it wrongly again. You have to first do a re-engineering, standardize the process, simplify the process, make it lean, and then automate. You will really achieve a fantastic result and your uh, KPIs will really go up, uh, up the, above the roof. Okay. Thank you both very much. Very animated on that particular uh, question, <laughs> both of you. Um, and, and just a few seconds, not a long answer, but what should people be thinking of giving the teams to succeed in this transformation to digital? We've convinced the CEO, we've found the money to consult, and we've cleaned up the processes, but teams need support and the right things as well, don't they? Um, but that so there's a couple of things you can do there the first thing is open communication um so that there's no surprises um they're taking on the journey with you um and also um we used to have some super users so it's about um creating uh, 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 a few individuals uh upskilling them and then and sharing those skills with the, they had go-tos then for, yeah. for, for help really. And that way you can probably get the best out of the software as well. Thank you. Navin, what would you argue that teams need? I, I totally agree. Communication, collaboration, and commitment. These are the three most important things which uh, any leader will have to provide to their team. One team should not be scared of that, okay, this automation will remove their job, no their job will be focused on more value-added uh, work which they can do. And that's where Caroline touched upon reskilling, upgrading their skill. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if they are scared, if they are not secure, they will never let automation happen. Once they're secure and once they feel confident, they will help and they will own the automation as the process. And that is where communication and collaboration is most important, along with the commitment that, yes, I'm even committed to you, not only on the process, but committed to you as a person also. Thanks very much indeed, both of you. Thank you, Caroline Adams and Navin Gupta from Datamatics. Thanks to you all for joining us. And for more information on membership and courses, please head to the IFOL website, where, of course, the research that's carried out can be found as well for, for members. Um, this webinar will be available on demand on the IFOL website from tomorrow. Feel free to share with any colleagues or friends who may find it useful. We'll send a link to top suggestions and a PDF best practice guide but for now, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Thank All you. Right. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye.